Bills Mafia, on tonight's Air Raid Hour, we will be breaking down all day three options in the 2024 NFL Draft. What position will the Bills target? Who won't be on the board? Who will be on the board? How do we rank players across position groups? We attempt to answer all those questions tonight. But first... A Cover One Network podcast. Here are your hosts, Judge Mathis and Tilt Money. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to the Air Raid Hour. My name is Steve Mathis. You can find me on Twitter at the Bills Guys. Joined as always by my co-host Dave Tilt, and you can find him on Twitter at Tilt Money. And this evening, Dave, one of our favorite shows of the year, we get to talk about some of our late round gems but before we get into conversations about our late round gems i want to talk about buffalo bills pre-draft visits because i have a little Mm. bit of a theory that i want to run by you obviously Mm -hmm. the buffalo bills are bringing in some receivers for top 30 visits and the buffalo bills are making it very well known that there are certain receivers in this pre-draft process that they are paying attention to people like Keon Coleman, people like Troy Franklin have all come to Buffalo to visit. Troy Franklin even got a pre draft workout. What Mm -hmm. I want to run by you is this scenario. If you're Brandon bean, are these Mm -hmm. the guys that you are genuinely interested in? And you're just trying to maybe stack your board because you have them all tiered in the same group, or are you playing mind games here? Are you inviting Keon Coleman and Troy Franklin because you don't like them as much as some others and you know teams are going to maybe want to try to jump jump you on draft day and you maybe want them to jump you for Keon Coleman or you want them to jump you for Troy Franklin so you can in fact get the guy you truly want. Is Brandon Bean playing mind games with the wide receivers on these pre-draft visits here? Well, I will say this, right? Um, if they didn't have interest in those guys... Truly, I, I think it would really be a waste of everyone's time if they were bringing them mm-hmm. in without having any true interest. I think that level of smokescreen seems unlikely to me. You're talking about multiple people from the organization involved in these visits. You're talking about the player himself, his agent, others around the player. It just doesn't seem like good business to me that you're if you would you would invite a player in for a visit that you're truly not interested in. To me, I kind of read it the other way. I kind of read it as, look, Troy Franklin, Keon Coleman, these are guys that are likely almost assuredly Mm -hmm. to be available to you at pick 28 if you don't move up the board. And the Bills very well may be sitting there saying, like, "These these are the guys we really maybe need to hone in on and figure out what's going to differentiate a Troy Franklin from a Keon Coleman or a Keon Coleman from a Troy Franklin, because we already know what the top guys like Brian Thomas Jr. Mm -hmm. and John A. Mitchell and Lad McConkey are all about. So we, we, we really need to take a look, a closer look at some of these other guys to see if throughout this visit process, they convince them, um, through mm-hmm. some kind of like extended interview process, they they share some shed some new light on some questions the Bills had, right? But mm-hmm. I guess in short, I I would think it wouldn't be great business if you're inviting these guys in if you don't truly have interest in them. Uh, see, I'm going to take a little bit different approach here. And Johnny Mack even comes in saying Vaughn is is laying a smokescreen for Brandon Bean. I wouldn't be surprised if these things legitimately are smokescreens, like. I'm not saying the Buffalo Bills don't have interest in the guys that they're bringing in, but maybe they have more interest in other guys. But if the other guys get taken, they're more than happy taking a Keon Coleman or taking a Troy Franklin. But there may be other guys that they're trying to hide their interest in more than others. I generally believe Brandon Bean plays these mind games because we've seen those sort of bills embedded and we've seen him talk to Pat McAfee. And he sort of talked about that strategy, trying to figure out who other teams are drafting. He had to finagle trying to trade up to get Dalton Kincaid. He had to convince the Jacksonville Jaguars that he wasn't going to take the guy that they wanted to take in order to, to get that trade to go through. 
So taking a look at the top 30 visits here, you have Quantez Stiggers, who was just announced today from the Toronto Argonauts. He's one of the more unique stories of this sort of pre-draft process. He had a really good Shrine Bowl. You have Keon Coleman, Mazon Smith, Andrew Phillips, the corner, Xavier Worthy out of Texas, Ryan Flournoy, the wide receiver out of Southeast Missouri, Troy Franklin, Trey Benson, MJ Devonshire, Jordan Morgan, Tez Walker, another wide receiver, Christian Boyd, Marshawn Nealon. They privately worked out Troy Franklin. They also mm -hmm. privately worked out Keaton Oladapo. They had Zoom interviews with um, Olufoshio, the linebacker from Washington, Evan Williams, the DB from Oregon, and Garglio, the center from South Carolina. And then I'm trying to look to see who they met with. Lad McConkey, they've met with a couple of times. Going back to the combine, they interviewed Brian Thomas Jr., Jalen McMillan, Adnay Mitchell, Roman Wilson, Johnny Wilson. So it's interesting because some of these names like Adnay Mitchell doesn't show up for a top 30 visit, but they met with him in the combine. He's one of the more sort of yep. polarizing figures in this pre-draft process. He's the one who maybe has to sell the Buffalo Bills that he's not some kind of lazy guy who doesn't take plays off, which is sort of his MO. And a lot of people in the draft Twitter community have broken down and showed highlights of maybe him not running the fullest of routes when the ball is not going his way, or even sometimes when the ball is going his way. So it's going to be really super interesting to see. Maybe the Buffalo Bills are absolutely enamored with Adnay Mitchell. And they're like, yeah, we talked to him with the combine, but we're just not going to talk to them at all. We're not going to top 30 him. We're not going to zoom him. We're not. We know that we love him. We're going to hide that. And we're going to bring some other people in to try to mask that. I just part of me thinks those mind games are going on right now. It's, it's getting to that part. It's getting to the silly season of, of the NFL draft. I mean, you know, you rattled off those names. We looked at, mm -hmm. you know, Walter football has like a really good um, a list of all the visits that teams have had. And like you mentioned the receivers, Brian Thomas, Jr., Tez Walker, Johnny Wilson, Roman Wilson, Xavier Worthy, Xavier Leggett, like Jalen McMillan. Like they've had conversations with a pretty much any receiver that could be mm -hmm. of interest to them. So it is interesting to see the guys that they do decide to have the 30 visits with. Um, I do think it's because maybe there are question marks and I like the, uh, the comment from Charles G there, top 30 mm -hmm. equals getting to know guys, medicals, et cetera. So that extra bit of diligence when you might be investing a first round pick in some of these guys. So, all right, well, that is not the theme of tonight's show, but I just want to get that off my chest, have a little brief conversation before we get into things. And tonight we're going to break down all of the various different prospects that could be available to the Buffalo Bills on day three, rounds four, rounds five, round six, and round seven. But first, this show is brought to you by Picasso's Pizza, four great locations in Williamsville, West Seneca, Lancaster, and Blaisdell. Buffalo Pizza since 1980. You can order online at picassospizza.net. And if you're an out-of-towner like us, you can even get it mailed to your home. And I can tell you from experience, it's just as good as getting it fresh from the restaurant. Again, that is PicassosPizza.net. Head on over there right now, get your orders in, and you will have pizza mailed to you so you can enjoy it on draft night while you are watching Cover One's live coverage of the 2024 NFL Draft. We'll be live with you all three days of the draft, various different hosts, and we'll talk about some of that at the end of the show this evening. But I want to start with the wide receiver talk since that's pretty much the most popular thing in, in, in Bills Mafia right now. So we're going to get that out of the way right here at the top. And I want to talk about the Buffalo Bills options, hopefully, if they decide to double dip in the draft, right, Dave? Hopefully this is not the first wide yeah. receiver the Buffalo Bills will be taking. But there are some interesting options here. We talked a lot on the uh, tier in, in the round two, the day two show. We talked a ton about all the various different wide receivers. And there is hope, right, in the in the Buffalo Bills community that some of these guys that we talked about last week could hopefully be available on day mm -hmm. three. But yep. you're not going to see as many of the big names today because we're playing it safe. We put them in the earlier conversations that we're going to talk about some other guys today. So I have on the board here my early day three wide receivers these are guys that i expect to come off the board in the fourth fifth round and you'll notice a lot of the boundary guys are kind of mm, they're kind of off the board so maybe the, some of the guys that we talk about late day three because there's gonna be plenty of x and z wide receivers maybe some of those guys sneak their way up but really the only boundary wide receiver that i have in this early third or excuse me early day three tier 
is Brendan Rice out of the University of Southern California, son of Jerry Rice. And then there's a lot of slot guys. There's a big athletic mm-hmm. slot in Luke McCaffrey. And then there's your more traditional smaller slots, guys like Anthony Gould, Jacob Cowing, Ania Smith, and Jaquan Jackson out of Tulane University. Do any of these wide receivers here in this early day three tier stick out to you? Well, you know, Jaquan Jackson's interesting, small guy, right? He's like under 190 pounds, five mm-hmm. nine, um, slot type of guy. And like this is where it's like tough for me because I get to I get to these I get to some of these players and I'm like, man, I really like this guy, but also man, we already have like two guys mm-hmm. that can play out of the slot. And like, do I really want to like focus my attention on guys like this? So then I go to Brendan Rice, right? And I'm like, okay, this is a big body dude. He's obviously got the pedigree. We've seen some of the clips of him, his blocking ability. How refined is he? Obviously played at a major program um, and had his moments, right? But is he something, is he, is he, what we've seen from him at USC, all, all of what we're going to see from him developmentally at this stage i think is the question mark for me with a guy like rice if there's more you can squeeze out of him then i kind of like him as a possible double dip Mm -hmm. option on the back end again presuming that you've taken someone else already i wouldn't want him to be the first guy uh taken but i could get behind him um as a double dip with one of those two fourth round picks should the bills decide to keep both of those picks yeah, Brennan, Brennan Rice, to me, if you decide to maybe go with like a Xavier Worthy early on in the draft. Right, that's the thing, you, the compliment. You kind of want that compliment, right? Brennan Rice, to me, Brennan Rice is Gabriel Davis. So the fourth round is essentially, I think, where he should be drafted. He seems very stiff to me. He doesn't seem very versatile to me. You just put him out there on the boundary and you just use him like a traditional Z receiver. So to me, I like Brendan Rice. There are some people that love Brendan Rice. And I just don't get it. Like to me, he's always going to be like the fourth weapon on a football team. Like even if he is, even if he's playing the boundary, traditional number two wide receiver on the boundary, I still think if you're a good offense, you're targeting your, you're targeting two wide receivers and either a running back or a tight end more than him. Like you're targeting three guys more than him. He shouldn't be a guy who's going to get you. 10 who's going to get 10 targets a game like Brennan Rice seems like the guy you're going to go through throw to five times a game so to me it's a great pick if we like I said go a guy like Xavier Werther early but he's just so very just stiff to me and he just reminds me so much of of Gabriel Davis Luke McCaffrey I think is the interesting one because I know everyone's going to talk about the lineage he's a McCaffrey right Six foot two, 198 pounds. He's got those 30 inch arms. So it's a little, little short on the arm side. He's still developing as a receiver after starting his career at Michigan as a quarterback, but he has shown uh, that he has a really good catch radius. He's shown a really good IQ to get open in zone coverages and to find the empty spaces in zone. He's really good going up, jump balls, contested catch. Your concerns with him is like, stacking guys and going vertical and he's still very young like route running so that could develop and at 6 to 198 eventually he could be a boundary receiver so a guy like luke mm-hmm. mccaffrey i think gives you a little bit of versatility and then i i love anthony gould and i love jacob cowing in this in this area here for the um buffalo bills as i pull up my notes here on on, on anthony gould and my computer <laughs> Peter's not being uh, very nice to me right now, but I mean, he's a small guy, five foot eight, 174 pounds, but he gives Close you return flex, right? He was all pack 12 on returner of the year, special teams player of the year. So he gives mm-hmm. you that flex to return punts because there's going to be a competition there for the Buffalo bills this year, but he's also a receiver as well. And he showed at the shrine bowl. And when you watch his game, you understand that he can move around. And I think a guy like Anthony Gould, he can give you what you got from Isaiah McKenzie in 2019. And Jacob Cowing is another guy, right? Who is also, I believe, again, let me pull up my, my notes He's here. Small too. Yeah. I mean, five, eight, 165 pounds, right? But he's another guy too, where he's just such a good route runner. He's so versatile. You are worried that he doesn't have a very big catch radius. And you're worried about him playing in the, the contact and the physicality of the national football league. 
But if you're just looking at these guys as a fifth receiver with some return flex, some gadget uses, some guys you can throw on the field to give you a little spark like Isaiah McKenzie did in 2019, I really like Anthony Gould. I really like Jacob Cowing, and you can even throw Jaquan Jackson in that mix as well as those types of receivers. Yeah, I mean, Cowing's interesting, right? Because you start to look back on like years past and maybe like size wise, like who he compares to a guy like Rondell Moore from a few mm -hmm. years ago, right? Who's actually made a lot of his hay um, with the Cardinals and the chances he's had a lot of it around the line of scrimmage, a lot yeah. of uh, a lot of his yardage is purely yak and it's pretty low yards per catch. And it's like, is that what cowing could bring you? Maybe a guy that could do some stuff for you around the mm -hmm. line of scrimmage, like maybe like Isaiah McKenzie did. And obviously Rondale Moore was a second, I think a second round, second, maybe third round pick. You're not talking about like that with, with cowing, right? This is a day mm -hmm. three guy for sure, especially in this loaded class. So again, you have, what is it? Seven picks, yeah. eight picks, sorry, on day three, as it stands right now, you have the two picks on day one and day two. So you have eight picks to play with on day three. If the bills want to double dip and it, maybe this is a situation, the opposite, right? Where if they went Xavier worthy and then a Brennan rice, maybe this is a situation where they mm -hmm. get maybe like a Xavier Leggett, let's say early on or a Keon Coleman, and they pair him with a, a cowing later in the draft. That could mm -hmm. be interesting to me as well. Yeah. Cause you look at it. I mean, I believe, and I'm pulling it up here, cowing struggled a little bit. No, he didn't struggle at all. I'll take that back. So, I mean, these guys are literally blazers. So, and again, they're light. So they're, they're going to fly, but these are the, like these, these playmaking guys, you got cowing with a four, three, eight, you have, um, let me pull it up here. Gould with a four, three, nine, and then you have Jackson with a four, four, two. So these guys can blaze and they can run those 40. So I really like all three of these guys here. I love Gould cowing and I love Jaquan Jackson. You can even throw Ania Smith, the former running back out of Texas A&M into that, that hat as well. I, I like all of those guys as a double dip, maybe like I, Isaiah McKenzie replacement type of player. But again, they have to be used in that right complementary role. Looking now at the later portions of the draft, and who knows, maybe some of these guys will go sooner. You have some X wide receiver guys, Jalen Coker. He's a you know a 50-50 ball guy, a uh, smaller school prospect. So he's really interesting. He's risen up in the pre-draft process. You got Bub Means out of Pittsburgh who text tested really well for a guy who is an X receiver size. You have Taewon Palmer, who I would say is probably like the late round, very, very raw version of Xavier Leggett in this draft. I mean, he is an explosive playmaker for his size. You have some traditional Zs, some field stretcher guys like Cornelius Lucas, Mo Marcus Rosemary, Jack Saint, Ryan Flournoy, Joshua Cephas, Isaiah Williams, Xavier Weaver, and Casey Washington. And then you have some slot guys as well. Taj Washington, who I know is a personal favorite of a lot of people in the draft Twitter community and Jordan Whittington, who's sort of a big slot in his own right as well. We talked about Luke McCaffrey being sort of a big slot. So there are some options here for the Buffalo bills in the latter half of the third round. I'll keep this graphic up here for a couple more seconds here, Dave. And who are some guys that really stick out to you? I mean, your guy Flournoy, right? Is getting mm -hmm. a lot of buzz right now, right? Obviously had the meeting. Um, Rosemary Jack Saint, I thought based on what, john and, and the guys told us from the senior bowl practice like you know he did what he needed to do in those senior bowl practices obviously caught the touchdown in the actual game there and i think like maybe gets overlooked a bit obviously lad mcconkey gets talked about a ton rosemary jack saint he's not necessarily he, he reminds me so mm -hmm. you know how we like talk about the dbs a lot where we're like okay this guy just does like he's solid at everything but he's not like blazing fast and he's not like super huge but he's like good tackler. We talked about this with DeMar Hamlin when he was coming out. We're going to talk about that mm -hmm. with a couple of the pit DBs. I feel like Rosemary Jack Saint is that guy as a receiver. I feel like he just, he will do everything you ask him to do. He can do a little bit after the catch. He's got a decent frame on him. Obviously did a good job at the senior bowl. He's interesting to me as a guy, like if you are later in the draft and you're just looking for an all around type of player, right? Not necessarily a, a specialist per se, a niche guy, but as a guy who could come and maybe play special teams for you mm -hmm. and and really put put him anywhere on the field and ultimately feel okay about it is an interesting name for me. 
Yeah, I mean, the name that sticks out to me, and and you mentioned, you know, you, you as you mentioned, Flournoy, Ike, he's just he's going to go and he's going to make plays down the field. So if you're looking for a field stretcher, if you're looking for somebody who has a boundary body, six foot one, two hundred two pounds, he's got thirty one inch arms, almost thirty two inch arms, he's got ten inch hands, and he makes plays down the field. Although it's at a smaller school, he shows that promise down the field. You can put him on the field, you can put him on the boundary, you can run him really far down the field, and it opens things up underneath for. Dalton Kincaid. It opens things up for James Cook. It opens things up for Khalil Shakir, Curtis Samuel, etc. So I think a guy like Brian Flournoy could have a role on the Buffalo Bills relatively early in his career, even though he mm. comes from that smaller school at Southeast Missouri State. Is he a guy who's going to get targeted 10 times a game again? No. Maybe he develops into that at some point because he's got the physical profile at 6'1", 202 and those 31-inch arms. He's got the speed. He showed that at the combine, but right now, you just throw him on the field and he gives you three, four targets a game, and he gives the defense something to think about down the field. So I really like him in this process as well. And you mentioned Jack Saint. He's a guy, he got a senior invite for senior bowl invite for a reason. He's got, you know, he's got the athletic profile that NFL teams look for. He played for a premier program. Cornelius Johnson yep. is a guy to me that I really to me, he is Donovan Peoples Jones, right? Like he is a guy I who agree with that. I agree was, with that. He was at Michigan. He was probably underutilized because they ran the ball so much and because of the offense that they run. He's got the athletic profile you're looking for. He's got that size and he's got that speed. He had a really good week at the Shrine Bowl. So a guy like Cornelius Johnson in the late rounds is a flyer to go out there and, again, just be a boundary body and compete to possibly be a Z receiver on this football team, even if it's not right away. That's intriguing to me. I really like Cornelius Johnson. Yeah, the size is there for him, right? And you wonder if he's just a little lean right now mm -hmm. um, going into the next level and people are going to like automatically want to make him Nico Collins just because of the helmet, but um, he's not as thick as Nico no. Collins. So he will be a Z. He will be... I, I love the comp to Donovan Peoples-Jones. I think that's a perfect comparison. Mm -hmm. Donovan Peoples-Jones a little more slender, but can get down mm -hmm. the field. Um, and look at this point, like you're going to bring in guys maybe to be competition for a Justin shorter, right? Somebody like that. And that could be Cornelius Johnson. So wouldn't mind that either later on. Again, it's all about the compliments. I think if we're, we, we keep going back to this double dip mm -hmm. compliment, the players you select with each other. We've seen the bills not do that in the past when they've double dipped, like for example, with Rousseau and Basham, will they, Go contrarian. Will it? It mm -hmm. maybe we should have that conversation. The double dip. Is it possible they double dip on two guys of the same exact, not same exact, but very similar athletic profiles? I think that's interesting. They could go for two boundary guys. I would highly mm -hmm. doubt we see them go for two slot guys, though. Yeah, because I mean, if you look at the room right now, you have boundary guys are Matt Collins and and Justin Shorter, and then the traditional inside guys are Curtis Samuel and Khalil Shakir. So they got some good inside guys. It, it's yeah. the outside guys where they, they need the competition. So as much and as we talk about, on the inside too, really. Yeah. So if you count him in that mix, so yeah, it's, it's the boundary bodies guys who can go out and play on the boundary and, and open things up for the guys over the middle and underneath. That's probably where the Buffalo bills are going to have to focus, but who knows this offense could look completely different from what we expect. It could good. It could zig while everyone expects them to zag. So there's a bunch of different, ways in which this offense can be created Taj Washington he had so much to me he, he reminded me so much of Quez Watkins just that tiny like speed slot guy who could get you down the field and get you those vertical shots but he ran a four five eight forty at USC's pro yeah. day which was shocking to me so I even moved Taj Washington no offense to Taj Washington because it looks better on tape he didn't really produce that much despite playing with a guy like Caleb Williams at a premier program like USC even though his film looks good um, and he had that slow 40. So I, I moved him down a peg because I think he might not get drafted as high as I thought he was. I thought Taj Washington could be a, a fourth, fifth round guy. Now I think it's more than likely he's a sixth, seventh round guy. And there's a reason why he wasn't a senior bowl invite. There's a reason why he went to the Shrine Bowl, even though he had a good week there and he is a good receiver. I think those things are going to ding his draft projection. So me personally, if the Bills took him in the fourth or the fifth round, I wouldn't be upset by it. But I think projection-wise, I think it's more than likely he's going to be a sixth or a seventh round pick. 
All right, let's go offense defense here and let's transition now to the defense and let's talk a little bit about the defensive line and let's yeah. look at some early day three options that the Buffalo Bills could have along the defensive line edge rushers. I think guys like Mo Kamara, Javon Solomon, Gabriel Murphy, Braden McGregor, and Jalex Hunt. I think the fourth round, fourth, fifth round maybe is where these guys start to hear their names come off the board. And then on the interior, you have the pluggers, guys like Tyler Davis, Christian Boyd. You have those like, are they three techs? Are they five techs? Like kind of where do you put them? Guys like Brandon Dorlist, Justin uh, Aboji out of Alabama. And then you have sort of those flex guys, guys like Jordan Jefferson, Leonard Taylor. You kind of just put them in a rotation. They can do a little one. They can do a little three. They can move around. They're not sort of fixated at one position or they're not truly a one or truly a three. So there are some options on the edge. There are some options on the interior. Let's start with the edge. What are some names that you like here on this list for the Buffalo Bills in round four? Uh, I mean, I like I really like those first three on the list. Kamara, mm -hmm. Murphy, uh, Solomon. Um, Solomon was a guy very early on in the process that I was drawn to. Obviously, you've got that um, that very interesting body type with Solomon, right? He's got like the mm -hmm. super long arms, but he's not really that tall. So it's a really interesting composition for him. And then you got Mo Kamara, right? Just like absolutely super, super productive in the Mountain West the last two years. Over 45 career tackles for loss. Had an eight sack, eight and a half sack season in 2022 that he followed up with 13 sacks in 2023 mountain west defensive player of the year now i know the competition the question of competition is going to be the thing that surrounds mo kamara athletically tested all right right mm -hmm. just under an eight raz so like pretty pretty solid um but this is the type of guy that i feel like the bills could use in the room right you have an uber productive pass rusher he's kind of like i now I'm blanking on the guy's name from a couple of years ago. D'Angelo Malone kind of reminds me of that type of situation where uber productive at the, mm -hmm. at a, at a lower tier competition. That's the type of guy I want to bring in under Von Miller's tutelage, right? You have the lengthy, bigger edge setting guys with Rousseau and Epinesa. Give me a guy that can get to the passer or was productive in college, has some pass rush moves in Mo Kamara um, and bring him in and learn mm -hmm. behind Von Miller and, you know, not to hint, but at our next, and our next show could be a name we see again. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll tell you what I, I like, and I'm going to pull this up again, just so I have the names in front of me. If the Buffalo bills drafted Mo Kamara, Javon Solomon, Jalex hunt, Gabriel Murphy, I would be absolutely ecstatic. And we know they talked to Javon Solomon. We know they talked to Jalex hunt at the combine. We don't really have any connections in the pre-draft process to any of these other guys. Mm -hmm. But here's my thing. Like Mo Kamara and Gabriel Murphy, they are just like the lowest percentiles, like in terms of like historical, like size for their positions groups. So yep. I, I yep. just don't know as much as I love Gabriel Murphy, as much as I love Mo Kamara and all the film studies breaking down just how awesome of a pass rusher these guys are. I don't know if the Buffalo Bills are going to want to draft these guys. Now, maybe round four, that stuff doesn't matter anymore to them. But mm -hmm. to me, I now That's start tough. shifting my focus to Javon Solomon and Jalex Hunt. But even those guys, they have some weird things going for them. Like Javon Solomon, he was a weak side linebacker for the first three years of his career at Troy. He's only six foot feet tall. Yep. He's under 250 pounds. But he's got those 34 inch arms yep. and he's got that 80 inch wingspan. It's like, what are what? you? And then it's like almost 11 inch hands. It's like, what are you? Like, so he uses that to his advantage. But if you're the Buffalo Bills, can you picture, right? If you're the Buffalo Bills, what do you do with Javon Solomon? Where, where does one? he go? Where does he go? Right. Where like, does he work? What does he fit in the rotation? Because I can't picture this guy fit in the run in year one. So is he just a pass rush specialist? Well, you have Von Miller to do that. You have other guys to maybe be the pass rush guy, Casey, Casey Tuhill. Can a guy like Javon Solomon beat him out? So it's weird. He's got like a son Redicky type of, of body. Um, it's weird to see like where his fit would be in the Buffalo Bills rotation early. Can they afford to redshirt a guy? Same thing with Jalex Hunt. I mean, Jalex Hunt is the freak of all freaks, right? This is a guy who was a former safety at Cornell before transferring to Houston Christian 
six foot three, barely 250, but he's got those 10 inch arms, 34 inch, um, 34, excuse me, 34 inch arms, 10 inch hands. He's got an 80, almost 83 wingspan. Like this guy is like legitimately nuts in terms of his body type and the length of his hands and his wingspan, but he's light. Like he looks light. He almost looks like a safety and he's playing edge rusher. He hits Mm -hmm. people though. When he gets around the edge playing that wide nine and he hits the quarterback, like this guy is dense. Like he hurts people. He breaks people. Like when he hits the quarterback, the quarterback feels it. So a guy like Jalex Hunt is super intriguing. And then I fall back to again, falling back to a senior bowl guy, Braden McGregor out of Michigan, six foot five, 260 pounds. He was part of that Michigan rotation. He really started to click late, had two sacks, I believe, in the college football playoff. A guy like Braden McGregor under the radar could be someone that I can easily envision plug and play into the rotation from day one. I think he might be the only one on that list that I think can give you, and I could be wrong, could give you NFL snaps from day one. I think Mo Kamara could too, but again, I just don't know if the Buffalo Bills like that prototype. So to me, that's where I struggle is where, where, how do these guys contribute round one or year one? Yeah. I mean, and the, and this is the position that I think if you were talking about day three, like you're probably taking one of these guys knowing that you're maybe not going to get a bunch of contribution mm-hmm. in year one from these guys. And maybe, I don't know who knows with all these picks, maybe the bills double dip at edge, right? That's yeah. I think not out of the realm of possibility, right? You have Von Miller question marks mm-hmm. about, about his ability to get back to where he is. And then otherwise you, yes, you signed two Hill, but Rousseau and Epinesa is, is mm-hmm. the youth. That's what you've got. I mean, Kingsley, Jonathan, one of these guys going to push, push Kingsley, Jonathan, maybe. Right. Mm-hmm. But, um, I don't think that's a guarantee either that any of these guys push Kingsley, Jonathan off the roster. Yeah. I mean, that, that might be the bills gauge, right? Like if they don't take one early, cause if they take one early, boom, like that, that player's got a role, but if yep. they wait and once you get to round four, I think your gauge is how confident do we feel he can beat out Kingsley, Jonathan, Casey to because that would be his competition for right. a roster spot for playing time, et cetera. These guys on the interior, I kind of, I like some of the names here on the interior that you could see go off the board early on day three, Tyler Davis, Christian Boyd, obviously the Buffalo Bills have a top 30 with Christian Boyd, Dorless, uh, Justin Igbogi. If the Buffalo Bills are looking for that three tech to go behind at Oliver, those are two names that are interesting. Kind of get that Quinton Jefferson vibe from a guy like Dorless. Then you got Jordan Jefferson. You got Leonard Taylor. These DT names, I know one sticks out to you. What's that name that sticks out to you? Yeah, I mean, you can't avoid Boyd, right, as far as going mm-hmm. – with the visit, but Jordan Jefferson to me, I've been really a big fan of his since even before the senior bowl and right around the senior bowl time. Um, you know, I put a list out of like non trendy names that I liked at the time. And Jordan Jefferson was on that list for me because of the, Mm -hmm. the, you, you put it right there in the graphic, that flexibility to play inside and out. Obviously he was on that line. Wingo and Mason Smith, they get a lot of the attention from that LSU defensive line, but Jordan Jefferson really was steady for that LSU front. And he's a guy that could be of interest to the bills because of that flexibility. He can come in maybe day one and be at all and at Oliver backup. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, he could come in and maybe replace Austin Johnson next year um, as the backup to Daquan Jones, right? There's options for the bills. If you go after a guy like Jordan Jefferson, Brandon Mm -hmm. Dorless to me is interesting because I feel like he's been pretty polarizing from like, the draft analysis community. I had a separate conversation with our guys, John and Dan from the cover one draft weekly mm-hmm. about doorless. Cause I was like, watched a couple of his games and I'm like, I can't figure this guy out. Like to me, he's like, he's like Darius Robinson. And then yeah. they kind of were talking to me about how like, well, you know, Darius Robinson uses his length better than doorless. Doorless is more of a, um, a better pass rusher, maybe than Robinson. Mm-hmm. Robinson's better against the run, but doorless maybe could slide inside right. and play some three tech. So what's the position for him right at the My, next level for Brandon Dorless? That's the biggest issue. And we had this conversation with John on our senior bowl review show. Yep. He cut, he cut weight to try to look right. like an edge. And I feel like that was the wrong move. I feel like he should have tried to bulk. 
and he should have tried him as a three tech. John and Dan both said they want him as a three and tech. And that's and I agree, but I think Brandon Dorless somehow for some reason sees himself as an edge rusher. And I just don't think that's where his NFL career is going to take him. At the combine, he weighed in six foot three, 283 pounds. He's got those 33 inch arms, 80 inch wingspan. He had that 485 40. Like he's just not like a linear dude. So to me, the move into the interior, if you can get him him up to 290, 295 pounds, and you can keep his explosiveness. He yep. fits that mold of a guy. If we if we miss on a Michael Hall Jr., if we miss on a Makai Wingo, if we miss on a you know a Gabe Hall, a guy like Brandon Dorless could be sitting there for you later on in the draft to be that pass rushing interior player, kind of in the mold of of Quentin Jefferson. Love Brandon Dorless's game, and then Christian Boyd. I was having this conversation with a, a, a number of people. The Buffalo Bills that top thirty visit wasn't wasted because we signed Austin Johnson. You know, because we added Deshaun Williams, Christian Boyd is pretty springy, even for a guy his size. So I think a guy like Christian Boyd can be three tech, one tech versatile. And then as his career progresses, as he gets older, he'll probably sift into more of being a traditional one tech. But I wouldn't pigeonhole him early in his career into that one specific role, especially while he's still younger um, and he's still got that athleticism to him. Now, as he gets older and you know, he probably switches back to that full time one tech. Is he probably better at one at one tech? Yes, but all of those one techs, Daquan Jones, 32 years old, you know, Deshaun Williams and 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 Austin Johnson, both one year deals. Yeah. One tech is not out of the equation for the Buffalo Bills. I think a guy like Jordan Jefferson probably fits the best because he can probably do like a little bit of both and then settle into that role, as you mentioned too. But don't don't count out Christian Boyd. It, for that type of of scenario, that type of fit as well. Yeah, I think Boyd and Jefferson similar. I think Boyd more talented probably. Um, I'd probably have him a, a peg above a guy like Jefferson. Mm -hmm. But again, with those two fourths, the multiple fits, like you have some room to play with. And if you know Boyd falls out of the fourth or Jefferson's mm -hmm. still sitting there in the fifth, like you you could convince me that any of those guys would be a solid pickup. Well, let's look at some of the gems here, some of the late round options for the mm. Buffalo Bills at edge rusher. We'll start there. You have Xavier Thomas, Jalen Harrell, Nelson Caesar, Miles Cole, Cedric Johnson, Khalid Duke, Sandita Anderson, Grayson Murphy, and Javante Jean Baptiste. Do any of those edge rushers sort of stick out to you as someone the Buffalo Bills might pursue in the back half of the draft? Harold's interesting. Obviously, we can talk about these Michigan guys all the time. Um, playing on that front, you can't ignore it. He's got just that steady experience there. Cedric Johnson's interesting to me. I think yeah. I saw, I think I saw someone. I can't remember who it was, but a fairly reputable, um, <coughs> a fairly reputable analyst had the Bills um, taking Cedric Johnson in their mock. It might have been. Uh, it might have been mm -hmm. Trapasso's full seven round mock. I think he might have had Cedric Johnson. If I'm mis if I'm misquoting who it was, then I apologize. But that's an interesting name to me. Like it's the edges. Once we get past that last group that we yeah we looked at, like I don't think Kala Duke. Like he's not he's not Uzama Odoki, right? Like he's he, like he's got the helmet, mm -hmm. but he's he's not that guy, right? He's not he's not going to be that guy. Yeah. Um, I, I really, there's a cliff for me here between that first yeah. graphic and this second graphic at edge. I'm not like, if the bills haven't taken an edge, I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm okay. If they don't take one at that point. Yeah. Because you, you think about it, right. You're like developmental edge. The, the NFL is just not like a developmental league. Like, it's just not like, it's so hard to stash these guys and year after year after year, we see the Buffalo bills lose guys i mean who daryl johnson the guy who was here for years and years and years could just never mm -hmm. quite crack the the roster it was always the back half of the roster we end up having to trade him to carolina because he was going to get snatched up on waivers and even then he didn't turn out to be anything so it's really tough i look at this like xavier thomas is like that old man directly because he was a six-year senior at clemson <laughs> is that going to transition to the nfl i don't know but you might have a pretty high floor in a guy like xavier thomas to come in and contribute early Jalen Harrell. I was listening to the NFL stock exchange podcast with Trevor Sikama and Connor Rogers, and they were talking about maybe him slimming down and moving to weak side linebacker because 
what are you going to get out of him stopping the run? He's just pretty much yeah. a pass rusher. Like no, Nelson right. Caesar, terrible measurables, like great pass rushing tape, absolutely awful measurables, absolutely awful combine testing numbers, like zero percentile type stuff. So do you really want to draft the guy at the end of the draft in the zero with percentile? Like, I don't know. So that brings me to, and then Khalid Duke just doesn't do it for me. Grayson Murphy again, Javante Jean-Baptiste, you're a six year senior and you're just now popping like, no. The two guys that stick out to me are Miles Cole and Cedric Johnson. Now, yep. Miles Cole, like this is a guy that you take a chance on at the end of the draft. Six yep. foot six, 280 pounds, almost 37 inch arms, 86 yep. inch wingspan. You watch him play and he's not good, but you sell yourself. You sell <laughs> yourself. You're like, how, how, how is he not good? Look at that body. How is he not good? You look at yourself, you sell yourself, and you're like, no, our coaches can fix that. And if it's just a seventh round pick, do it. Like, holy hell, that guy is just absolutely freak. So if you can somehow tap into that athletic potential, go for it. Cedric Johnson tested amazing. Yeah, he fits very well. he fits the archetype. 6'3, 260, 33 inch arms, 80 inch wingspan. Like he can he has the body to play the run and fit the run from day one. Yep. A guy like Cedric Johnson, you might be able to get later on in this draft, high floor, maybe low ceiling, right? He could contribute to be a rotational edge rusher. So we're really just picking guys that we think can be like rotational pieces at this point, And we're just nitpicking here. And that's why Miles Cole to me is the one that sticks out the most. Like just draft the freaking freak and yep. see in the sixth or the seventh round if it turns into something. Because if it doesn't, who cares? It was just a sixth or a seventh round pick let's take a look at these idls now uh mckinley jackson that big zero tech out of texas a&m evan anderson who's got meetings galore out of fau he's meeting with a bunch of teams logan lee a guy who had a big shrine week um blew up the combine and then you have some of these other flex guys right fabian lovett senior Jawan briggs who are both guys who i think are going under the radar in this pre-draft process along with guys like keith randolph jr and Jaden crumut crummity out of mississippi state so I like some of these late defensive tackles and low key. I know we added two def defensive tackles in free agency and signed re-signed Daquan Jones. I wouldn't mind if the Buffalo Bills took two defensive tackles in this draft. And there are some guys late. I think we're taking a flyer on. I'll put this graphic back up for you. Any names stick out mm. to you? I like where your head's at on the two defensive tackles, especially as we go one early. Logan Lee is the guy that really kind of had caught my eye recent in mm. recent weeks, probably a couple weeks ago where I was like, started really getting into Iowa because I was like, oh, is Cooper Dijon maybe going to fall to the Bills? So I started watching some Iowa um, and Logan Lee was the guy who was starting to stand mm -hmm. out. And I was like, I went back and I was like, OK, this guy tested really well at the combine, had the 9.16 Raz. Archetype wise, I mean, man, he's in that sweet spot, right? That 281, 6'5", mm -hmm. like he can probably add six, seven pounds, not really lose much there. He's got the big hands, the over 10 inch hands. Um, the arms 32, 32, it 32 plus. So like not too bad for an interior guy. The wingspan's not huge, but that's okay for an interior guy. And so, um, Logan Lee bills like their Iowa guys. Um, I'm keeping my eye on yeah. him out of that group. And he I think that the most snaps of like any defensive player in college football last year, yes, like he was and, a workhorse for them. And, and that's what people will come back and argue against it is like, Hey, some of his advanced metrics don't good, look great, like his average depth of tackle and all this stuff. And it's like, well, the dude played like like almost three times as many snaps as like any other <laughs> like, defensive lineman. So over time, like his yeah. efficiency numbers are just not going to be great when you play that many snaps. So I'm yeah. not too worried about that. Those snaps are great experience, and I uh, I don't think they would be looked as a as a downside for the for poor him the poor regional scouting. scout who's put in charge of Logan Lee having yeah. to watch all of those snaps. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, like I don't really get the McKinley Jackson hype. He's just a big body to me, but I do like Evan Anderson out of FAU, Keith Randolph Jr., Drayden Crumity. He tested really well. I kind of I'm really intrigued by his size. Fabian Lovin Sr., he's a big-time playmaker next to Braden Fisk from FSU. Jawan Briggs, big, powerful guy. He had a really good college football playoff a couple of years ago for Cincinnati. Obviously, Cincinnati's come down a little bit back to earth, but 
Randolph Jr., Crumity, Fabian Lovett Sr., Juwan Briggs, Evan Anderson, Logan Lee. If the Buffalo Bills double dip at defensive tackle and add any one of those guys, I, I will be thrilled. Like, I don't know if I would be thrilled if they were the only defensive tackle we took, but I certainly would be thrilled if we double dip there because I would love some youthfulness along that defensive line because I'm really not sold on the depth there behind Jones and behind Oliver. And even if it does mean carrying five defensive tackles because you want Austin Johnson and two rookies, go for it. Or maybe mm-hmm. you can fit one of these later round guys onto the practice squad for a year. Go for it. Add some youth to this interior pass rush and this interior defensive line. I, I think it's I, I think it needs um a jolt. And I think Brandon Bean made it clear last year he was mad he didn't get a defensive tackle. I think he's gonna be pretty forceful uh, in adding one or maybe even two in this year's draft. Let's flip it now back to the offense and let's take a look at some early day three offensive linemen. I really Mm. like this group. If the Buffalo Bills took two offensive linemen in the fourth round, I wouldn't even be mad because if we got two of the, you know, a dozen or so names that are on this list, I would be thrilled. You got it off to tackle Garrett Greenfield, Karan, Emadebiji, uh, Christian Jones and Walter Rouse, tackle guard flex, Javon Foster, Matt Gonclaves, Caden Wallace. And then on the interior, you have guys like Trevor Keegan, Hunter Nazard, Isaiah Adams, Tanner Bordellini, Cedric Van Pran Granger, Charles Turner, and Bo Lemur. A lot of centers in this year's draft and a lot of centers with intrigue in this year's draft and a lot of tackles I like this year too. It's a deep class for both in my opinion. And if the Buffalo Bills decide to go, you know, tackle slash guard and then, you know, guard slash center with their two fourth round picks, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be upset at all. Let's get some youth. Let's get some depth on that offensive line and let's keep protecting Josh Allen. What are your thoughts on this list here? Um, these tiers here and, and some of the players available maybe early, early in day three. Yeah, I know you're a big fan of, of Greenfield and so am I. Um, checks a lot of boxes, obviously archetype wise, that six five, three ten to three fifteen range mm-hmm. is kind of in that sweet spot for sort of what the bills look like. I like Caden Wallace personally. Um, you know, tested well, six four, three fifteen. He's right in that sweet spot for what the bills like. I think he is a guy that can bring you some versatility. And when you start talking about mm-hmm. guys on day three, even if it's early day three, you look for a you look for something like that. The Bills have obviously signed Lyle Collins, but what is that going to give you for the long term? Probably not anything beyond 2024. At least that's the expectation. You see teams like the 49ers having guys like Caden Wallace in for visits. So that should tell you something when there's teams having a guy like Caden Wallace, who we project to be maybe a day three guy coming in for 30 visits, top 30 mm-hmm. visits. Um, that that catches my eye. Obviously played almost exclusively a right tackle his senior year. So will he be able to slide inside in a pinch? Probably so. Um, and he's just a really interesting name to me uh, there. Walter Rouse, I like as well. The tackle from Oklahoma, uh, the Stanford transfer. Um, he's got really nice size at 6'5", 313, got the big hands, um, really long arms, has the super mm-hmm. long wing, wingspan at almost 84 inches. I like the Oklahoma tackles in this draft. I like Rouse. I like um, uh, Guyton, who is an obviously an early, mm-hmm. early round pick. But the Oklahoma tackles, I, I, I'm a fan of in this draft. Yeah. And then I think Javon Foster was on that graphic as well, wasn't he? Yes, not, uh, yes, he was so, um, guard tackle. You yeah, know, he's Missouri. only played tackle at Missouri. I think yep. he's got the body. A guy like Aaron Cromer is going to want to move him onto the interior. Oops, that's the wrong graphic no and that and that's exactly and that's exactly it with foster right you mentioned like what is Mm -hmm. he just seems like a guy aaron cromer would like a guy that might have some flexibility six five again 313 so again fits right into that sort of archetype fifth fifth best run blocking offensive lineman per pff in 2023 that's of all offensive Mm -hmm. linemen with at least 200 snaps so graded out well for javon Mm -hmm. foster you just look at all those names on there and we talked about this last week on our offensive line show, but there's just the physical tools that I think Aaron Cromer is going to love to work with. You have Delmar glaze out of Maryland, six, four, three fifteen, with almost a 35 inch arms. You have Javon Foster, six, five, three thirteen, with yep. almost 35 inch arms. 
you have Walter Rouse, 6'5", 313, 35 inch arms. You have Caden Wallace, 6'4", 314, 34 inch arms. Matt Gonclaves, 6'6", 327. He's a little heftier, 33 inch arms. Garrett Greenfield, 6'5", 311, 30, almost 34 inch arms. Christian Jones, 6'5", a little on the lighter side at 305, but he's got almost 35 inch arms. There are just so many of these specimens that I think that Aaron Cromer is really going to want to work with because pretty much all those guys that I mentioned, with the exception of a few, are guys like like David Edwards was a tackle when he came out of Wisconsin and they kicked him inside. Aaron Cromer loves the versatility of his offensive linemen. There are just so many tackle guards there in that early fourth round. Guys who are traditionally tackles, but they can move inside and give you versatility. Maybe even come in and compete with David Edwards from day one. Like that is, that is, I think the kind of talent that will still be on the board in the fourth round when the Buffalo Bills go to draft. And then on top of that, you have a ton of guys who Hunter Nazard, I think, is a guy who could come in and compete with David Edwards right away and give you a backup center option. Trevor Keegan, he's probably just a straight up guard but I think he's a pretty good one and he could be legitimately a guy you draft in the fourth round. Maybe it takes him a year, but I think he could be your starting left guard next to, mm-hmm. you know, Connor McGovern and next to Osiris Torrance. You have center guys who can develop and maybe provide you some insurance for Connor McGovern and Tanner Bordellini, Charles Turner, Bo Lemer, Cedric Van Pran. Like there's just, I love I love that graphic because there are so many players there. If the oh, Buffalo graphic. Bills decide to, to just double dip in the fourth round offensive lineman, I will be so happy. Yeah, I mean, this is uh I'm having fun looking into these offensive linemen this year yeah. because there Which is a is lot not, of in- not the usual. <laughs> it's not the usual, but you know, we got a Cyrus Torrance last year, mm-hmm. and it was like, man, we got a stud right guard. And you just see, I know he was a second round pick and probably could have been a first round pick, honestly, yep. the way guards are getting paid these days. Osiris Torrance is playing, a, a, the market is telling you a premium mm-hmm. position. Guard right now is being paid like a premium position in the NFL. Like whether you think it is or not, it's being paid as such. So it is really interesting to me to look at some of these day three guys who have that mm-hmm. sort of inside out flex. Like Nick Broker was that guy for me last year, that day three guy for me last year. And obviously, unfortunately, got poached, but that's who I'm kind of looking for now this year in this day three group. And I I I like a lot of these guys that can be that type, like Caden Wallace, mm-hmm. like a Javon Foster. Those those guys seem to fit that mold for me a bit. And there are even some guys late day three. So let's take a look at some of the late day three guys now. Travis Glover, combine snub, has been on a ton of pre 30 visits uh you have tillon grable who had a really good combine ethan driscoll who we talked about on the offensive line combine show just athletic testing and size measurables very similar to a connor mcdermott who the buffalo bills were obsessed with for the longest time frank crumb uh neem dunkwa like these are all like really nice physical specimens that can be developed at the tackle position nathan thomas more of a guard tackle not too intrigued with the the guards, uh, JVN Cohen, Ladarius Henders. I'm not too intrigued with that group of guards there, even though there is one guy with the last name Bills. I wish they were better. Um, <laughs> guards never really float my boat unless they're like the Osiris Torrance of the world. For me, very rarely does a pure guard, a guy who can't snap the ball or move outside, entice me at all. I love the t- guard tackle flex. I love the guard center flex. If you're not flexible, which a lot of these guys in the middle column are not, I'm just not a big fan. But then again, you have so many center options in this draft. If you're looking for a Devi center or a break glass in case of emergency center, like your ninth offensive lineman, Drake Nugent, who I think is like a Brian Allen type that the Buffalo Bills could really like, Dylan McMahon, Andrew Rame, um, Kingsley Egabon, Jarrett Kingston, Matt Lee. Like these are all solid, solid, dependable pivots and guys that I can picture the Buffalo Bills drafting in the seventh round. And hey, if Alec Anderson doesn't work out as your backup center, and Will Clapp doesn't work out as your backup center. You got a guy like Drake Nugent, who you drafted in the seventh round. Maybe you can sit him on your practice squad or be your ninth offensive lineman. And you have them that you can plug in, maybe even play their rookie year if they have to because of injury. I like some of the depth of that center class. And I'll put that graphic back up here for you to uh, talk about me, some of the guys that you like. Yeah, I mean, look, I I like McMahon, obviously. And like he's getting listed as a center, but 
he's actually played more career snaps at guard mm -hmm. than he has at center um, prior to taking over the pivot this last year at NC State full time. And look, he if you look at him athletically, he tested very, very well. Um, that NC State offensive line has been one of Dave Doran's sort of feathers in his cap over the past several mm -hmm. years. He's done a really good job with that offensive line at NC State. And McMahon really athletically similar to Mitch Morse, a guy that obviously is out the door now, a, a little bit shorter, but height, weight, similar. Scouting report, similar, right? Can climb, can move in space. His anchor is something that sort of gets questioned at times. That's mm -hmm. the thing that you worry about with McMahon. But like, if this guy was a little bit more sturdy in the interior, we'd, we'd be talking about McMahon as like a as a probably a day two yeah. type of player. So, um, one name I'm gonna throw out there that wasn't on the list at tackle. Go for it. I love it. Is Josiah Ezram from Eastern Kentucky? Uh, you read up his scouting report in Dane Brugler's The Beast and. You go back and you start like researching this guy, 6'5", 329. So maybe he's a little bit out of the, the range, but mm -hmm. 10 and three quarters inch hands, 35 and three quarters inch arms, 85 inch wingspan. And he's on a little bit on the older side. He'll be 23 by the time the season starts. But man, this guy stalwart right tackle mm -hmm. for Eastern Kentucky in 2023, almost ex played all of his snaps, pretty much all of his snaps in 2023 at right tackle. That's an interesting name to keep an eye on. D Dane Brugler has him just outside his top 20 in his tackle list. And this is a deep tackle class. Mm -hmm. So just a name to keep an eye on for, for, uh, for the people out there. Speaking of guys who aren't on the list, we're going to get into the secondary now. And I've combined sort of split safety, box safety and cornerbacks all into to one graphic for the sake of our conversation here tonight. There are just too many cornerbacks for me to get an eye on in this pre-draft process. So I sort of just zeroed in on a couple that I think the Buffalo Bills might be interested in because they're Bills types of corners. So if there are corners that people in the comment section want to share, if there are corners that you want to share and they didn't make the list, uh, I tried my best, but there are just so many corners every year and so many get drafted. So this, uh, this graphic is not going to be perfect, but for the sake of conversation here, early day three DBs, um, split safeties, guys like Sione Vaki, who might end up being like a running back or a wide receiver out of Utah. He's just that kind of athlete. You got the undersized Jalen Simpson. Then you got more guys who maybe are more traditional box guys, but maybe the Buffalo Bills might see more in them as split guys. Tyke Smith out of Georgia, Kitano Ladapo out of Oregon State, Malik Mustafa out of Wake Forest, and then James Williams, who's probably going to move to linebacker out of the University of Miami, and he's obviously got the connection to the Buffalo Bills' new cornerbacks coach, Jamil Ladai. And then at corner, Elijah Jones, MJ Devonshire, Nehemiah Pritchett, Chow Smith-Wade, Ryan Watts. Some of these guys like Devonshire have return flex. Some of these guys like Ryan Watts could make that transition to safety. And then a lot of these guys are like that typical zone E, like, hey, they have really good like football IQ, they have really good ball hawking skills, but they're just undersized type of bills type of corner that they seem to be attracted to in the back half of the draft. So those are the corners that I added. I'll leave this graphic up here for a quick minute here. Dave, who are some guys that interest you? Well, well, first of all, let's just, this is a perfect segue into Scott's uh, mm -hmm. super chat here, right? So, and Scott's been a long time viewer of ours, so I appreciate yeah. this, Scott. Uh, I think we should double dip on defensive tackle or edge rusher or even safety or cornerback. So let's bring that graphic back up. Yeah. And look, I think it's realistic when we start talking about what composition we can put together in the secondary here. Like, you got a guy like Tyke Smith who can maybe come in and be a backup slot right from mm -hmm. day one and also play safety in the box. You have a guy like MJ, MJ Devonshire who size wise has not played slot in, in college, yeah. but size wise may have to maybe go that route when it comes to the next level. And he brings you that kind of ability on punt returns as well. So that's interesting to me. James Williams. I don't really know what he is. Uh, if he's a linebacker, he looks like he's got like the the body of an edge rusher, but he's like playing <laughs> safety. It's just a weird situation. And then you got two of my favorites, like Malik Mustafa and Jalen Simpson. Mm -hmm. Mustafa, the big hitter from weight. Jalen Simpson, the coverage maven, obviously a little bit more slender. 
lots of different body types and styles with this group. The Bills could really use a, a little bit more youth, right, at the yep. safety position. And so you got Mike Edwards in on a one-year deal. You got Taylor Rapp, who the money you're paying him doesn't necessarily mean you he's guaranteed to start the life yeah. of that contract. That's why guys like Tyke Smith are interesting to me who can come in and play maybe multiple positions from day one. I, I've made it I made it known that my dream scenario is that we draft Javon Bullard and Tyke Smith because I feel like Javon Bullard can uh be the backup nickel and can compete with Mike Edwards at free safety and Tyke Smith can be the backup nickel and compete with Taylor Rapp at strong safety. And they would just be both even if they don't start, like they would just be behind those two and waiting in the wings to be like the next generation of of bill safeties but yeah mike edwards is on a one-year deal yeah what's to stop the bills from bringing in two safeties because their competition is cam lewis and damar hamlin like no offense yeah. to either of those two gentlemen but they could easily be beaten out if the buffalo bills draft the right way and they decide to double dip at the safety position so maybe you look at corner safety flex and a guy like dwight mcgothern who we're going to talk about in our next tier Maybe he could be a cornerback. Maybe he can be a safety. Um, you look at Ryan Watts. Maybe he can play a little bit of corner. Maybe he can play a little safety. So it'll be really interesting. Defensive da- tackle, I'm game to double dip. Edge rusher, I am not. Safety, I'm game to double dip. Corner slash safety, like just a secondary player, I'm game to double dip. I am game to double dip at wide receiver. I am game to double dip at the offensive line. It doesn't have to be like, I, I, I wouldn't like two tackles or two guards, et cetera, but just offensive linemen in general, I'm game for double dips at multiple positions because I feel like the Buffalo Bills, that's what they're doing right now. They're recultivating the youth of their, the, 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 the back end of their roster and they're bringing in some youthful players and it's going to be some development. And there's going to be some lumps this year with the depth. It's not going to be as veteran savvy as it has been in years past. And I would love for guys like Will Clapp and Lyle Collins to not be on the roster come September because they're beaten out by rookies like that would be great so if to me double dipping at all those positions except for maybe edge rusher I'm totally game for yeah and I think the the double dip in the secondary is super intriguing right because you could have guys who come off the board and they may call their name and they may be like safety blah 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 and it could be Mm -hmm. a guy like Tyke Smith who could play slot or they may call a guy like McLaughlin who we're going to mention in a second who they're just going to come on the screen as cornerback, but those are guys that maybe are going to be naturally, naturally maybe a safety at the next level. Now I will say this, like I just want to caution all of us, even myself included. Like we talk about guys moving positions a lot, right? Like it's been talked about for, about Christian Benford. And it's like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to go, I don't want to go there yet until we see the bills, like truly, go that direction with a player, which they really haven't done yet, by the way. Cam Lewis um, would be the only one. Cam and Lewis would probably be And that was one. a slow, prog- like a caveman, right? Like just a slow progression year after year mm-hmm. uh, over time. He slowly transformed himself. And they don't, I don't even think they still even admit he's a safety. <laughs> and then and then you got Jordan Poyer and, and Micah Hyde, right? Who are both corners technically coming in and mm-hmm. they moved to safety. So like right they have to go away. like all yeah. yeah, they moved they moved right away, right? But since then the Bills really haven't moved guys around in the secondary so much. But mm-hmm. again, you got Rasul Douglas. He's only they did not extend him yet. He I mean that could still no, happen. That was noteworthy. They could have yeah. saved money by extending him. They chose to just cut money and add it back in incentives. They did not yep. want to tack years onto his deal. They didn't. Yep. Yep. And Trey White's gone. So you've mm-hmm. got Christian Bedford. What are what's going to be the the future and the story for Kyir Elam? Rasul Douglas, like we just said, is only here for just this year. Cornerback's like a sneaky need and a backup to Ter- Taron Johnson's is, is a how big How dare need you well. disrespect Jamarcus Ingram like that? How dare you? Okay. Well, <laughs> I know Chris Janky will be pissed at me for that one because he's projecting Ingram to make the 53. So we'll um... see. Uh, onto the back half, and, and there are a lot of names here. I like like that's a, that's the one thing about corner and, and safety. If you're gonna find gems, you're gonna find guys late in the draft. These these are the positions to do it. At split safety, you got Tyler Owens who tested out of this world out of Texas Tech, but also thinks the earth is flat. So he's got that going for him. Uh, Mark <laughs> Perry, Millard Bradford, Evan Williams, Jalen Key, Josh Proctor. Box safeties, you got Kenny Logan Jr., who Aaron Cromer is a huge, or actually not Aaron Cromer, Aaron Quinn's a huge fan of. Jalen Carlisle, who's probably going to move to linebacker when he gets to the pros. Dominique Hampton, who literally played just 
every position for that Washington defense. He played a little bit on the boundary, he played a little bit nickel, played a little bit split, he played a little bit box, he played center field. Like he just did everything for him. I love Dominique Hampton as a versatile chess piece. And then at corner, nickel, you have there's just so many nickel guys here, right? Like Miles Harden, Daquan Hardy, uh, Dwight McLaughlin, Tareeb Still. Quantez Stiggers, the the Nick nickel guys, so many type of, but they're like they they're undersized, but they have great football IQ and they're ball hawks, etc. Like that's the type of guy you're gonna get late in the draft, and maybe one of these guys pops. Jarius Monroe is more of a size guy at like six foot two. He's got some crazy athleticism. The Buffalo Bills probably saw a little bit of him when scouting Dorian Williams from Tulane. Daquan Hardy, I think, is interesting because he's got return flex, so I think he could be like a later version of MJ Devonshire and um, AJ Woods pit DBs, man. AJ Woods would be a guy who could come in and compete on the boundary. He He's a guy who could gun on special teams. Like he really impressed people special teams wise uh, at the shrine bowl. AJ Woods bills, local pro day uh, met the bills met with him at the shrine bowl. I, I, AJ Woods just seems like a guy who screams, seventh round pick yep. or priority free agent for the Buffalo Bills. But any names on that list really stick out to you? I know the Buffalo Bills had a virtual with Evan Williams. The draft mm-hmm. network used the word Jordan Poyer in their scouting report for him. So a guy who can do everything but doesn't have crazy athleticism, that's the Bills type. Like at safety, Brandon Bean has said it. Like mentally they're there. Maybe physically they're not what everyone else expects them to be, but they do all the things we want them to do. Yeah, let's bring this graphic back up again. Um, how dare you leave off Trey Taylor, my uh, my one of my <laughs> favorites. Uh, Kenny Logan, right in the box. Um, he actually was on my that same list I mentioned earlier, the sort of mm-hmm. non-trendy name list. He was on that list, that same list I had um, Jordan Jefferson on, the same list I had Kamani Vandal on. Kenny Logan played almost fifty percent split between box and deep mm-hmm. last year, so he is better, probably suited in the box. He does have returnability as well on special teams. I like Kenny Logan a lot. Um, in the in that corner group, there are really two guys that have stood out to me. Miles Harden really got a chance to look into him a lot last week. Really loved him and his ability to play up and around the line of scrimmage. Size-wise, played on the outside, uh, you know, there. And at the next level, though, I think he's going to end up being on the inside. I think he's going to be a slot. So I kind of really liked mm-hmm. Miles Harden as a fit from a scouting report standpoint. Very willing tackler. Very willing to throw his body around. Fits the run well. Seems like he has that same kind of mental makeup as a Taron Johnson. And Dwight McLaughlin, right? He was on mm-hmm. my list as well. That non-trending name list. I have to mention him. Maybe he plays safety at the next level. I know Aaron Quinn, also a fan of McLaughlin. Um, I like that Arkansas, uh, I like that Arkansas defensive backfield. So, mm-hmm. um, I like those names there. AJ Woods, we mentioned teammates with Devonshire, yeah. the Bills love the pit DBs. Wouldn't shock me at all. If the bills yeah. came away with one or one of the two of Woods or Devonshire in this draft. I think Hardy's a sleeper too. I know Sean McDermott has a relationship with Manny Diaz. He's sort of like his inner coaching circle guys. He communicates with Manny Diaz was the defensive coordinator at Penn state this year. So a guy like Hardy with return flex, a guy who mm-hmm. can maybe be a backup nickel. That might be something that really intrigues the Buffalo bills. I know he's got a lot of snaps under his belt there at Penn state. All right, let's close out now with the running backs. Sorry, we're not going to talk about tight ends or quarterbacks tonight, guys. I know you wanted to, but, um, mm-hmm. Taking a look at maybe some of the guys who could be available day three, early day three, right? I think these are the guys who can be primary ball carriers in the NFL. And maybe it's a pipe dream that some of these guys will be available. But I personally believe that running backs are going to go later this year than usual. It's going to drop some guys into early day three that maybe aren't typically there. So maybe some of these are a pipe dream like Braylon Allen, but who knows? Uh, Marshawn Lloyd um, and Tyrone Tracy Jr. I think can be primary backs in the backfield. I think Tyrone Tracy gives me a lot of Tony Pollard vibes late to the running back position, former wide receiver. He can play special teams. Like he can just fill so many different roles on a football team while he continues to develop as a runner guys who I believe are probably going to be one B's or twos in the NFL Blake Corum. He just doesn't have the pass catching flexibility. I think to ever be truly a number one feature back in a national football league in the modern NFL same with, you know, Audrey Gastemay. I love Audrey Gastemay. Uh, Braylon Allen, great athlete. Just give him the football and let him go. Try to find space for him. Ray Davis, the six-year senior who's well-traveled from Temple to Vanderbilt to Kentucky. 
a lot of fans. He's sort of that pinball, low center of gravity type of guy. The freak athlete at Isaac Garenda, who I think is just like a souped up version of, of Ty Johnson. You can use him in a multiple two ways, including new kick returns. And then this is going to offend some people, but Will Shipley is practically a receiver playing running back. I don't think uh, he's anything more than a scat back in the National Football League. He just does not do well with contact. He does not do well. Um, he just, just does not do well with contact balance. I think Will Shipley is a kind of a running back you can split out like you can James Cook. So I think there's a versatile skill set that I really like with Will Shipley. But what are your thoughts on some of these names here? I know you like a number of these running backs. I will say this. I was – we people can change their minds, right? And I think it's mm-hmm. sometimes hard for people to come off of a guy or get onto a guy that they either previously didn't like or maybe they liked and then you know maybe change their mind. They don't. Marshawn Law, Marshawn Lloyd is a guy in the beginning I didn't love. Uh, admittedly, I was concerned about his ability to pass protect. Um, I wasn't mm-hmm. sure about like what he was as a runner, but the more I watched, I felt like he had pretty decent burst in the short area. Um, size, I thought he, I think he looks good. I, I don't know exactly where he's going to end up going in this draft, but I, I've come around a bit on Marshall and Marshawn Lloyd and like mm-hmm. him. Obviously, I think Estime and, and Allen there and that second group. Um, would be really nice compliments to James mm-hmm. Cook stylistically. I know Garendo is just like everybody's darling right now. I will say you yeah. were on him probably before a lot of people were on him. Um, yeah, but thank you, Brett Coleman. The, that was that was the, all Brett. <laughs> the, the star of the combine, or one of the stars of the combine, yeah. the the fastest forty time of all the running backs. I mean, like that's just a guy you find to put on your team, yeah. one way or another. Uh, everyone loved this guy. So I kind of just like let everyone else talk about him the whole pre-draft process. But if Audra Gastame is there in the fourth round, man, mm-hmm. like he just like, like when we talk about, he reminds me sort of like Leonard Fournette. And I know he doesn't have like the 40 time of a Leonard Fournette, but I mean, Estime is sneaky fast. Like he's such a powerful, like he just play. he's such a violent player. First of all, like just the violence with which he plays with, it's just fun to watch. But when he breaks and he gets into the open field, he does accelerate pretty quickly. Like I, I, his speed, his speed takes time, but once he builds up, he popped a number of 60, 70, 80 yard runs at Notre Dame. Like he had some big time touchdown, took him to the house distance. He housed some. And for a guy that size who doesn't run a great 40, you're like, huh, what? But it just, he sort of gains that speed. He gains that momentum as he goes along. So Audra Gastame. One of my favorite players in the draft. I don't talk about him a lot because everyone talks about him. And maybe everyone doesn't talk about him, but we're just used to it because we got Chris Kepner in our cover one group chat. But um, <laughs> I love Audrey Gessman, man. And, and Braylon Allen, too. Like, again, don't talk about him a lot because a lot of people talk about him. But, man, if one of those guys are sitting there, if any of these guys outside of, no offense, Will Shipley is sitting there in the third in the fourth round, pull the trigger, Brandon Bean, I won't be mad. Uh, on to late day three now. I know your favorite. And I'll give you a chance to talk about him in a moment, and that is Kamani Vidal. But there's also Bucky Irving. He might go sooner. I'm not buying it with that testing and that size. I'm just not buying it. I think he'll be available like late fifth, sixth, seventh round. Frank Gore Jr., Dylan Johnson, Isaiah Davis, Cody Schrader, Kendall Milton. And then you have a ton of like, just kind of like scat backs in the back end of this draft that are really intriguing. Dylan Laub, small school guy, Rasheen Ali, who got hurt at the senior bowl, but he's a pretty good receiving back on a Marshall. Amani Bailey, who tested poorly, but had a big senior bowl week catching the ball out of the backfield. Jaden Sheridan, a guy where Buffalo went to his pro day, even though he wasn't testing. So either there's another player they were going to look at, or they wanted to talk more to a guy like Jaden Sheridan, Blake Watson, who we covered in our running back episode. Um, just an insane athlete, but he's, he's tiny. And then Keelan Robinson, who didn't get a lot of run at Texas and before that at Alabama. And he's sort of just waiting in the wings. He tested really good at the combine. He's a speed back. He has pass rush. Uh, he has pass catching chops and he can help you in the return game as well. So a lot of fun flyers here in the back end of the draft, but I know you love Kamaya Vidal. So I'm gonna give you a chance here to talk about Kamaya Vidal real quick. Yeah, and I know. Look, I I know he's not a power back, and people are going to be mm-hmm. you know talking about that in the in the comment section. But he is he's just a good football player, right? He's he's an excellent pass protector. 
He had the second most yards after contact of any running back in college football last year. And I know it's at Troy, so I get that. Um, mm -hmm. But some of the things that I wanted to have answered about him at the combine, he did answer, right? Some of his testing, his running, like when you watch the game film, he doesn't really look super fast, right? But he did run a pretty good time at the, at the combine. I think it was a four, four, six 40. So the things that I want from, from a compliment, right? Like if it's pass protection, if it's someone who is reliable as a pass catcher, which he is 92 catches over his career, someone who can actually give you something offensively. I, I like Vidal and look, he's short. I get it. Mm -hmm. He probably would look more, looks more like Devin Singletary than he does a power back, but I do like him a lot. Um, Kendall Milton, Kendall Milton. Uh, mm -hmm. we talked about him on our running back show, our little back and forth we had with our top five backs. Um, I like Kendall Milton from Georgia, 14 touchdowns last year, really pretty much splitting that time last year in the backfield yeah. probably doesn't get talked about a lot, but I just felt like every time he touched the ball, it was like good vision, got the yards that were there, had some, a little bit of ability to break away. Kind of like the estime style. I would say didn't mm -hmm. test well, uh, 40 like young, time, but like, like a young Chris Ivory, when he got into the open field yeah. and he got that head of steam, like you said, like he, he could run away from some guys as well. So I do like mm -hmm. Kendall Milton a lot as well from that group. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that'll just about wrap it up for us this evening and our day three preview show. Join us tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Dave and I will be doing dueling mock drafts. So I'll have a mock draft. He'll have a mock draft. We'll put them head to head shark tank style. You guys in the comment section can sort of rate who's having the better mock and vote to see who has the better mocks. So we're going to do that little thought experiment tomorrow night with a twist. And that twist we will reveal to you tomorrow night. But before we go, would be remiss if we didn't tell you about our NFL draft coverage coming up. Dave, I'll throw up the graphic and then you can sort of break down the draft coverage people can expect from the people here at Cover One. Yeah, so for those of you who have followed us for the past couple of years here at Cover One, um, we will be bringing you wall-to-wall -wall coverage from the draft uh, or for of the draft and from the draft, I might add, which is not on mm -hmm. this graphic, but round one, um, you can catch... Steve and I hosting Anthony pro ant will be a panelist for the duration. Chris Kepner producing on night one. We'll get going at 8 PM. There will be no commercials. We'll go through all the picks uh, of night one. We'll see what mm -hmm. the bills do at 28. If they stay at 28 rounds, two and three pro ant will be hosting on Friday night. Steve and I will be there as panelists for Friday night coverage. The roundup guys will have you covered for day three. Um, and a variety of people rotating in throughout. Mm -hmm. John Helmkamp, uh, Thomas DeLouse, and Joe DeRosa will be live on site at in Detroit at mm -hmm. the draft covering. We'll be popping in and out of our live coverage throughout as well when they have a chance. So we're really looking forward to bringing yeah. you guys really great coverage again. This will be what our fifth year going mm -hmm. back to Fanatics of doing draft coverage, which is it's just awesome. Best so, time of year, baby. It's my Christmas. Uh, it's our Christmas, I believe. So, um, yeah, and I believe, too, uh, first round, our coverage will probably end about 15 or 20 minutes after the Bills pick. And then Greg Thompson and Pro Ant will be going live in a separate feed to discuss the Buffalo Bills first round pick as well. So we have all of that coming up for you over the course of the weekend. And we will see you all tomorrow. If you could smash that like button, hit that share button, let all the people know to come join us here at the Air Raid Hour twice weekly talking NFL draft. And then once the NFL draft is over, Dave, I don't know what we're going to talk about. Maybe we'll take a, a day off or so. <laughs> a week off or so. We'll see. <laughs> uh, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, go Bills. Go Bills. Thank you for watching tonight's episode of the Air Raid Hour. Make sure to hit that like button on the way out. If you are catching the show on demand, leave a reply in the comment section and we will respond over the course of the week. You can always listen to every episode next day on all major podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify by searching Air Raid Buffalo. Thank you for your continued support and as always, Go Bills! <laughs>